Hi there, I'm Gary, I'm an ordinary bloke doing stuff. Welcome to my channel and welcome back if you've been here before. Now, I'm making another kit today, but unusually, it's not an Airfix kit. It is an AZ kit of this very, very old aeroplane, the Saunders Row SR-53 rocket-powered fighter. Now, I bought this because I've always liked the plane and it looks interesting, and it comes with a selection of what they call what-if markings. You know, what if it had actually gone into service? It didn't. It was essentially just a research aircraft. However, we'll make it, we'll see what it looks like. Now, um, I'll give you a quick history of the Saunders 53, um, a quick look at what's in the box, and trust me, it's a pretty quick look, and then how we go about building it, okay? All of those bits are in chapters. You can hop backwards and forwards as your heart desires whilst you're watching, okay? So let's get on and have a look at the history of the Saunders Row 53. Designed to reach and shoot down fast enemy bombers at high altitude, the SR-53 was a prototype interceptor using both jet and rocket propulsion. During World War II, the Allies understood the power of strategic bombing. The Luftwaffe responded by fielding the Messerschmitt Me-163 Comet as a point defence fighter to combat the waves of American B-17 bombers. It was designed to be able to reach as high as 12 kilometres, or 39,000 feet, within just three minutes of takeoff. This spectacular performance came as a price. The Comet carried fuel for just eight minutes of powered flight, after which it was a glider, and the fuels used were extremely unstable and highly explosive. It came too late in the war to make any real impact. In the 1950s, the Soviet Union started to deploy their nuclear bomb-carrying Tupolev Tu-4 Bull bombers, direct copies of a captured B-29 Superfortress. Pressure grew in Europe to find suitable defensive fighters. The jet-propelled Tupolev Tu-16 Badger and long-range Tu-95 Bear bombers were already in development, and NATO feared that the Soviets would soon be able to create supersonic long-range bombers. In Britain, the Air Ministry issued an operational requirement for a missile-armed, rocket-powered fighter capable of reaching 18 kilometres, or 60,000 feet, in just 2 minutes and 30 seconds from takeoff. Led by Chief Designer Maurice Brennan, the Saunders Row Company, better known for making flying boats, submitted the design of the SR-53. In addition to a de Havilland Spectre rocket engine, the SR-53 had a Rolls-Royce Viper turbojet, allowing powered flight home. It had a projected top speed of Mach 2.44, or 2,600 km per hour, at an altitude of 18 km. The Spectre engine was fuelled by kerosene, the same fuel as the jet, with hydrogen peroxide as an oxidizer. After various redesigns, the first aircraft flew on the 16th of May 1957. Just two prototype aircraft were constructed, the second of which was destroyed in a takeoff accident in 1958, claiming the life of pilot squadron leader John Booth DFC. By this time, the government had decided that aircraft development would soon take second place to missiles. The rapid advances in radar technology, giving more advanced warning of attack, added to the huge developments in jet engine design, resulting in future aircraft such as the English Electric Lightning, meant that mixed propulsion fighters were no longer needed. The program was cancelled after just 56 test flights. A derivative design, the SR-177, with improved radar and an afterburning jet engine, was intended for the fleet air arm and the German Air Force, but never progressed beyond a half-finished wooden mock-up. The first prototype of the SR-53, XD-145, survives to this day and is preserved at the RAF Museum at Cosford in the Midlands. The 
the box art is okay, representing one of these what-if colour schemes. Not terribly dynamic, but okay nonetheless. There is one other version of this 2017 kit, which is the prototype with markings for both of the prototypes that actually flew. In 2021, AZ released a new toolkit with a two-seat variant. One box with British testing and training markings, the other with colours for Canadian, German and Saudi Arabian service. I'm building the single seat what if aircraft which they call the Rocketeer. I'm sure the Air Ministry would have called it something else, Cobra perhaps. Inside the box is this single plastic bag containing everything. The largest thing in here is the single sprue of grey plastic, just the one as it's a pretty basic kit. The wings come in one piece because they are really really thin. There's a choice of fire streak missiles or data pods used during testing, I'm guessing we'll go with the missiles. There's a very basic cockpit. All of the parts are fairly well moulded with decent visible panel lines, finer than you get on airfix kits. And there is some flash on a lot of the smaller parts, suggesting the moulds are getting a little bit tired. There is also a single piece transparency for the windshield and canopy. Then the decal sheet. It's quite small and densely packed, not as crisply printed as others. There's a very slight sort of fuzziness to them, and the colours really aren't as dense. The sheet has the decals for three aircraft. First of all, we see the common decals, plenty of them, and you know what, they're reasonably readable. Then there's scheme one, X8121, ostensibly an aircraft of number one squadron, RAF. Then there is Scheme 2, XA215 from 74 Squadron RAF with its Tiger emblem and red tail. Finally, Scheme 3, XA251, an aircraft of 20 Squadron based in Germany in 1964. All of these schemes are shown on the back of the box, along with the decal placements. And then the instruction leaflet in full colour, nice and glossy finish. Two and a half pages of A5 size to describe how to build this kit. There really is very, very little to it. That's what we get in the box. Let's see how I made my SR-53. Now as normal, the first thing I've done is washed the kit in gentle detergent and given it a light coat of primer. Then I paint all the interior parts in black. This includes the walls of the cockpit on the fuselage halves. In front of the cockpit space is the well for the nose wheel, which I'll paint in plain aluminium. At the rear of the plane are the two engine exhausts. I'm going to paint them with burnt iron. Now the black instrument panel has been dry brushed with a tiny amount of white and a few dials added in. Then I'm adding dots of various other colours, fairly much at random. After that I put a bit of clear gloss varnish on each dial to give the appearance of glass. I'm really not sure why I do all this as the canopy is going to be closed and I probably won't see it. But I guess it's good practice. Now the liner on the seat I'm giving a leather colour and then some grey at the top of the headrest. So now I can assemble the cockpit. First the control column goes in, then the seat follows it, and then the instrument panel at the front. When these essentials are in place, the cockpit tub gets fixed to the rear bulkhead and the whole thing left to dry. Once it's set, the cockpit section can go into one half of the fuselage. Next is the interior of the nose gear bay. This has a roof and a back wall that join together. Then they too can be placed into the fuselage. At the back of the fuselage are some engine discs, the top one for the turbine of the jet engine and the other for the exhaust of the rocket engine. Finally, there are these small intake liners to fit for the engine inlets, and I'm ready to join the fuselage halves. Now these do go together pretty well, 
but there's a slight issue with getting the alignment quite right as there's quite a lot of play in the mouldings. Once I'm happy I can clamp and tape the fuselage up and let it all set. Onto the wings then which are single pieces the only thing I need to do is to trim the end of the wing tip this allows me to fix the launch rails for the missiles. If you're using the data pods for the test aircraft, you don't need to do this. They just slot over the rounded ends of the wings. I do need to clean the fin or the vertical stabiliser as there is a whole lot of flash from the moulding process here and the two halves don't even seem level. The flash also means that the locator pegs on the top and bottom are misshaped so you might find it easier to do without one or two of them. When you're happy, the fin can go on the rear fuselage. While that's setting, I can start painting the wheels with steel centres. I'm also going to add the canopy now. I'm using contact to clear to hold it in place. And I'll probably let that set overnight. Next day, I'll fit the wings. Again, the locator pins are pretty ropey, so... Plenty of sanding, plenty of dry fitting. When they're secure, I can start on masking the canopy as I'm spraying this kit. I use a PVC tape, which I find really easy to place, and to chase into the frame with a sharp wooden cocktail stick. Then I can cut it with a very, very sharp knife. That done, I can add the new tailplane or the horizontal stabiliser, and when it's dried, I'm ready to paint. This scheme is very simple, just all over dark aluminium at first, followed by a blue strip along the top of the fuselage and the tail assembly. Once all the paint has dried up, I'll start on the decals. I found these to be very fragile, which is a bit of a pity as this is a recently released kit. Luckily, I have spares of roundels. While the decals are setting, I'll paint the wheels entire black. I'll also do the missiles. I'm painting them in white. The seeker head will be a gloss black later on. Now, one leg of the main gear broke while I was getting it off the spruce. I can show you how I repair them. Here I use a blue tack or something similar to hold the parts in contact but away from the surface of my mat. I then put a dab of ultra thin cement which deeps into the whole joint and then leave it alone at least for an hour, preferably overnight. Back on track again and I'm placing the nose wheel in here. There's a small locator hole for the top of the leg in the roof of the bay. Then the main legs, they have two locator slots to support them. And when they're dry, I can slide on the wheels. They're a bit of a tight fit, but okay. Then the gear doors. Now the inner door sits on the end of the well, like this. The outer doors come as one piece, if you want the wheels retracted. But with the wheels down, you need to cut this piece into two. The smaller piece fits against the base of the leg, like this. Then the rest of the door sits against the bottom part of the leg. Of course, there's also a nose wheel door. This fits on the port side. Then there's a small antenna that goes on the underside of the fuselage, and I'll give all of that time to set up for a while. Back to the missiles now, I've painted the black nose and I'm going to use a spare decal from another kit to jazz it up a bit. The decal's a little bit small, doesn't go all the way round, but I can just paint in the rest of the colour bands by hand. Next the nose probe goes on. Now I found this quite loose, so it is very difficult to get it to sit just right. So when everything's set, quick once round touching up the paint, peel off the masks from the canopy and my SR-53 is done. To be fair I wasn't expecting a huge amount from this kit but you know what it's okay if quite basic. The fit can be a bit suspect as the moulds are getting tired even though they're not yet five years old 
and the decals are quite fragile and not as good as Cartograph. However, there aren't many options for such a very unusual aeroplane and the what if content is fun and pretty creative. I'm glad I made it, but do you know what? I won't be rushing to buy another one. If however you've enjoyed watching the video, do please take the time to subscribe to my channel where you'll find plenty of other build videos and future projects as they're completed. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time.